Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you all. I'd like to read from Whispers from Eternity. The sunbeams of thy love shine equally on all the members of thy cosmic family, whether prophet, hero, villain, tiny moth, or me. It is our own fault if we make ourselves opaque by our own mental and emotional dullness. Teach us to wipe away the dirt of error from the windows of our understanding. Our arms are weak for the task owing to our long inner spiritual resistance. O oh, Master Cleanser, lend power to our efforts that we may wipe away every last spot that clings to our mind, obscuring our transparency and preventing free entry into thy light. O oh, make us fully clean again, invisible in our egos, because transmitting only visions of thy beauty, which lies within us all. Om. Peace. Amen. So um, I wanted to talk this morning about that transparent light within us, that within each one of us, um, we are two beings. One is the ego, our human nature, and the other is that shining light of God, always present, always there, and how we lose ourselves when we move away from that light. And when we move away from that light, we suffer. We are challenged. We are, um, you know, all the things that we get depressed, we get upset, we get all kinds of things. You, you make your own list. I don't need to make it for you. Um, and those things are what keep us separate from the light within us, for holding ourselves back. Um, many years ago, I read a beautiful, beautiful book, and there was light. And it, I'm sure people have heard the story, because I think people refer to it often, but it's the story of a man, well, when he was a young boy, he had an accident and he became blind. I think he was like nine or ten when it happened, eight maybe. And of course he had been able to see and then he couldn't see. And he had, this was um, in the 30s in France. He's a Frenchman that wrote the book. And he had parents that were pretty... Um, uh, forward thinking for the time especially because they sent him to a school for the blind as you would but the boy came home after a week and he said you know they are afraid they teach me in such a way that makes me feel afraid and I don't want to be afraid because when I'm afraid everything gets dark black and that makes me more afraid. So his parents said, all right, what would you like to do? And they sa he said, well, you teach me and let me find my way with this, basically. So they did. They did this. And he does all kinds of um, sort of games, but really teaching himself how to live with being as impaired as he was, losing his sight. Um, and... As he grew up, he became very, very aware of how much the light guided him. So fear made it dark. Fear made it impossible to be able to function in the world. Because when you have fear and it's dark, whether you can see or not, you're impaired. You very much are impaired. He discovered that when he, the light was 
in him. Literally, he could see light. He said, the world opened up for me. I could move through the world and never trip or hurt myself. When I was afraid and it was dark, the world closed in on me. Sound familiar? (laughs) You know, these are not... This is spiritual truth, but this was his absolutely literal experience. This is what he knew. He said, also, when there is light, joy comes with it. This is so beautiful. Joy, light, the world opens up for me. In other words, the world is helping me. The world is letting me through and supporting me as I do what I need to do. When I'm in fear and darkness, joy leaves, light leaves, the world closes in, and everything is challenging. He said, I trip more, I stumble more, I bang into things more. So his every, everything that he did every day internally was to bring the light, to see the light, Not to push away fear, to draw in the light. And with it always came joy. And he said, when the light went, joy went. Amazingly beautiful. I remember this image he created. He was waiting for someone. He was leaning against a building on a wall. And he said, I realized as I leaned there that the building was leaning on me too. Such a beautiful, connective, um, loving, kindly way to look at the world, to feel about the world. So the, the kind of message is that the more that we feel God in us, especially as light, in other words, that we have faith and trust that God is with us always. It doesn't matter if we're perfect or not. God isn't standing there, arms folded, tapping his foot, saying, well, you know, when you get it together, then then I'll come to you. God is waiting to be with us and be present with us now. He's waiting for us to acknowledge him, her, it, however you refer to God. That we, God is waiting on us, and we get caught up in the darkness, in the fear, And joy flees, light flees, and with them faith. So having the faith and trust to keep moving forward, to know that God loves us now, right now, not waiting until you get it together or you're perfect or whatever it is. I'm always reminded, I think it's because I'm in Sacramento and this happened in Sacramento. I'm always reminded of... The work of a devotee is a constant one of reminding ourselves to be faithful and to let out our soul nature, to allow it to manifest, to allow it to be drawn out. And every situation, every person that is in our world at any given time is there because God is creating that situation, that circumstance, that meeting up with whoever it is, just for you to grow in what we're talking about here. And this is no small task. It's like a constant thing that we have to remember. Relax, breathe, be open, move forward. So what I was going to tell you, And this is about the effort, the work involved in in trying to maintain our relationship with God, with the light of God, with our own life of faith. Um, Many years ago, Carmen, who used to live, some of the old timers here will know Carmen. And I don't don't know where she lived, but I know she lived in Sacramento, which is a big, uh, you know, that covers a lot of area. And I was coming down here to give Sunday service like this. And I came a couple of days earlier because Carmen wanted me to stay with her. And um, 
So I went, it was winter time, so it was dark when I arrived, and it was cold and rainy. And I walk into her house, and it's pitch dark, absolutely black. And I yelled out, are you here? She said, yes, I'm in the kitchen. I said, where's the light? Can I turn it on? Realizing she's blind, she doesn't need the light. Yeah, I forgot to say that. Excuse me. <laughs> she's blind. She doesn't need it. So I turn on the light. She's in the kitchen baking cookies. What a revelation that was. No light. She's baking cookies. Just, just um, supporting what we are talking about here. The, she had a seeing eye dog named Fibber. Great dog. He was a golden, golden retriever. Beautiful dog. And I took Fibber out for a walk while she was making cookies. And even though he didn't have his harness on, when he has his harness on, he's on duty. He's a seeing eye dog. And when he doesn't, he's not on duty. So he was off duty with me. But I still had a leash. And I decided to kind of test him. <laughs> so... We're walking down the sidewalk, and there was a lamppost, and I acted as if I was going to walk into the lamppost, and he got right in front of me. He, he put his little body between me, and oh, it's so sweet. But anyway, the story I want to come to is, um, the next day, we went to a, a park that was close to where Carmen lived, and she has the guide dog. Now, to, let me tell you something about guide dogs. There are only about three or four breeds that will allow themselves to be trained as guide dogs. You can probably imagine them, you know, the smart ones, the intelligent ones, the responsive ones. And they train them for a year. That's a lot of training, a year. And then they bring in real blind people put them in harness with the blind person and have them go through their paces, so to speak. Some dogs don't take the responsibility. They've had the same training as every other dog, but they get their harness on, they're with a blind person, and they sometimes do it, sometimes don't. Well, they can't be guide dogs, seeing eye dogs. So the ones that take the responsibility become guide dogs. So they've gone through a lot of training to become guide dogs. So that's Fibber's story. He's a real live guide dog. He took the responsibility to do this all the time when he's in harness. It's like being in uniform. If you're in your uniform, you're on duty. If you're in your harness, you're on duty. Okay. But he was doing it with me even when he wasn't on duty. That's how inculcated the training becomes. So we are going to the park. To go into the park, there is a um, turnstile gate, right? So they start going through the gate, and I watch him. You know, I kept stepping back because he's leading her through this complicated thing with all these, you know, they have all those bars sticking out, it could be, but he got her through. So we all get through. And on the left-hand side, there was a big tall hedge, maybe six foot tall hedge. And out from under the hedge comes a cat. And Fibber lost it. He lost it. He lunged for the cat. And of course, she's Carmen is totally at his mercy. She has no control. And I said, what can I do? What can I do? And Carmen said, nothing. This is between him and me. <laughs> I mean, it, they had to deal with it. It was not, I couldn't do anything. I mean, I could have, but she said no. So she's pulling on him, and he's up on his hind legs, barking like crazy, with it, you know, paws up, lunging for the cat. And she's, fibber, fibber. The cat disappears back under the hedge, and it was almost like you heard Fibber go, oops, <laughs> because he dropped down on all fours. He came over to her right, which is where she's holding him, and he started to lie down, stand up, lie down, stand up, lie down, stand up, and I said, what is he doing? 
he was disciplining himself. Because in the school, when they're training them, if you disobey or do something like this, your owner says, lie down, stand up, lie down, stand up, 50 times. He did 50 push-ups without being told to. Isn't, isn't that phenomenal? It's phenomenal. He, she waited. You know, he's lying down, standing up, lying down. St- <laughs> and I counted. He did 50 push-ups. So when he was done, it was like he went, <sighs> and off we went. Off we went. But the point, <laughs> the point, <laughs> if, if a, an animal, you know, a, an animal that gets trained can refuse or allow the training to take hold. What excuse do we have, guys? <laughs> we, we have to do what the masters direct us to do. We're trained to do it. We've lived this life, if you're new at it or old at it, this is the life to live because it works. And if little old Fibber could do it, we can do it too. You know, he was yellow. I called him Brahmacharini, Brahmachari Fibber from then on, or yoga, yoga Fibber, Yogini, Yoga. How do you, Yoga... Yogi, yes, whatever. I, I, I gave him a name because I was so impressed by that kind of dedication and taking responsibility. It is never, ever anyone else's responsibility. It's every single one of us. To, to, responsibility to what? To live the spiritual life, to develop our faith, to allow the light to shine from within us. And I don't mean everybody's going to look the same. We're not. We're all different. Some people are more social. Some are more reclusive and reserved. Some are, you know, whatever we are, we can do it in our own particular way. Whether it's big, you know, you think of a Gandhi or a Mother Teresa or a master, Christ, their, their stories were grand and huge. Not all of us are going to have that kind of spiritual life. We are going to have quieter ones, subtle ones, but no less important for our own self-realization. If we know that God loves us, the relationship between Carmen and Fibber, for instance, when she said, nope, this is between him and me, we have, that's her responsibility, is to work it out with him. You can't have somebody do it for you. None of us can. God is waiting for us to turn to God. Every, because we use, we use plural terms a lot when we talk about God. Universally, unconditional love for us. Us is a very collective term. But it also turns into you, each one of us. You and God, each soul and God, it isn't always collective. It is transcendent and imminent. It is impersonal and personal all at the same time. That we be responsible, we be the ones that create the situations where we can draw close to God. Yes, sadhana, of course, we have to do our spiritual practices. There's where the individual relationship with God is built. But what is also going on is we are developing the light. All of the great teachings of the masters are about allowing the light to come out of us, are about doing techniques and practices that uplift from the inside We are uplifted every time we meditate, every time we focus here. It's a powerful magnet for the presence of God to rise up and come out in whatever it is we're doing. And in meditation, it is directly going to God. But then everyday life becomes the proving ground, just like the training for the seeing eye dog. 
you, you do all the training, it's all in there, and then we bring in blind people. Okay, let's see how you do. Some do it, some don't. Do you understand? In everyday life, your sadhana shows. What is in the heart, Christ said, whatever the heart is filled with will come out. How, how it, what is the quote? The, the, the heart out from the... Uh, from the full... There it goes. Thank you. Speaks. From the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. That, what is your heart full of? What, what is going on in here at all times? And if you don't know or you have to guess, then we need, some, we need to do more training. <laughs> the cats come out from under the hedge. <laughs> we just lost it. <laughs> so, so the idea that we be the monitors of our own um, awakening to the light within us with, of course, the guidance of God, with the guidance of the masters here. We have five avatars helping us. Take advantage of that. Be in light as much as possible. Live in light as much as possible. You know, I did a class for the Kriyabhan retreat, and a, and a quote came to me then, and it's coming to me now, that many years ago, um, Swamiji, Swami Kriyananda is the founder of Anandra. I don't know if there are people here that are new. Um, but Swamiji had just finished the book, um, Self-Realization. Essence. The Essence, thank you. <laughs> the Essence of Self-Realization. And he was going to send it to SRF, and he wanted me to, you know, package it up and, and send it. And he had a note in there. And he was saying that this is the book that is going to create a bridge between Ananda and self-realization. Now, he said that with every book he wrote. He sent them a book. They, never, they either never responded or they sent a rude letter back. So my mind, every time he said it, was like, well, I don't think that's going to happen. Why is that going to happen? <laughs> so again... I'm thinking it, but this time I thought, I'm going to say something. Like, he doesn't know. I, 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 I'm going to be honest. So he is, you know, talking about, we were looking for an envelope, a, a padded envelope to put it into. And, and I said, you know, Swami, it seems to me that the better the book, the worse they react. In my, in my wisdom. <laughs> and he, he said, he went very quiet and very seriously. He said, Uma, I can't afford to think like that. And I was totally ashamed of myself because, of course, he knew exactly what was possible and probable. Exactly. Totally. Like I was telling him something. This is how the ego works. Further, I, I realized how, um, how much, how constantly he upheld the highest level of consciousness in terms of outlook, in terms of what could happen, in terms of... And we think we're being... I have to find the right word. <laughs> we think we are being appropriate, wise, aware, clever to point out the obvious. Well, they're, they're just going to, you know, what they always do. I can't afford to think like that. It, it's become a mantra. We can't afford to think any less than the masters tell us to, which is Think of God all the time. Think of the best all the time. Think positively all the time. Think about others in their highest all the time. Be even-minded and cheerful all the time. Why? Because the other is so easy to do and pointless, useless, obvious. Everybody does that. 
we have to be different. We're guide dogs. For ourselves, I mean, for our souls. <laughs> you can't behave like a normal dog. You have to behave like a guide dog. We are yogis. We are trying to gain self-realization through service to others, through meditation. You, you understand? And, and coming together like this reinforces that in each one of us, encourages each one of us to keep moving forward. But we, you know, we, we feel like we're pointing something out that's so important when we point out the negative, the problem, the, what can happen, what can go wrong. But it's not so. The masters are constantly telling us, uphold consciousness. We can't afford to think like that. And carrying that for all of us, his Swamiji, his example of maintaining that all the time. I can't afford to think like that. I won't think like that. I refuse to think like that. Be like that. <laughs> Be that way. Tell yourself. Talk to your soul. Let the light out. It's in there. It's in all of us. Let, let everyone feel the joy, the love, the presence of the masters through you as his channels. God bless you all. <laughs>